Hello, and thank you for watching this presentation titled To Weigh or Not to Weigh, a decision-making framework for weighing practices in the treatment of eating disorders. My name is Kate Lane. I'm an accredited practicing dietitian at the Centre for Integrative Health in Brisbane, Australia. I'd like to acknowledge my clinical psychologist co-authors who are an invaluable source of knowledge and guidance in this project, Dr. Kira Buchanan and Catherine Hillahan. Before I begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the First Nations people as the traditional owners of the land on which I am presenting today. I recognise the country north and south of the Brisbane River as home of the Turrbal and Yuggera people, and I pay deep respects to all Elders, past, present and emerging. I can declare I have no commercial relationships to disclose. I would, however, like to take a moment to talk about weighing for the purpose of weight control and eating disorders. Aside from those patients who require weight restoration, weight and weight change are not a criterion by which the severity of eating disorders or remission of the illness are defined in the DSM-5. I want to let you know that the development of this framework has taken place in the context of my view that patients who are experiencing psychological distress in relation to their weight and shape should not be weighed for the purpose of further enhancing weight control as this perpetuates the harmful pre-existing cultural narrative around the imperative for weight control as social currency and it's unnecessary to achieve clinical remission as per the DSM-5. So, the great debate. Weighing seems to spark a debate that reaches across geographical, occupational, theoretical and experiential divides within the field of eating disorders and it represents a significant gap between what is recommended and what is done in practice. Indeed, weighing of eating disorder patients is widely regarded as a pertinent component of many leading treatment models. But in practice, clinicians vary significantly in their views on weighing and how they do it, if at all. There also remains a lack of empirical evidence regarding the impact of weighing procedures alone on the outcomes of eating disorder treatment. So what are clinicians doing? Well, less than 40% are weighing regularly in session and up to 43% rarely or never weigh their eating disorder patients. Of those who are weighing, more than half report generally using blind weighing. So why is this? Well, it seems some clinicians may be more inclined to blind weigh than to open weigh when the patient is perceived to be significantly cognitively or emotionally impaired due to malnutrition. If the clinician or patient perceive they're unable to tolerate or regulate the patient's distress, if the clinician typically endorses treatment approaches that don't specify open weighing, or if weighing is anticipated to lead to disengagement from therapy. Clinicians may be less likely to weigh at all when there's confusion regarding roles within the treatment team, if the patient's weight has been unduly influenced by factors external to treatment, if the patient refuses, if the clinician is concerned about exposing the patient to weight-based stigmatisation or shame, and if the clinician is delivering an eclectic or non-specific intervention. So to date, the published literature has focused on the importance of weighing patients in the context of adherence to empirically supported treatment models, as well as the variation in clinician weighing practices, such as blind weighing versus open weighing, and the reasons why this might occur. I'd like to suggest that the weighing debate requires a more nuanced perspective in which different weighing practices might be advantageous over others under certain circumstances. And so my co-authors and I aimed to combine clinical experience and published literature to develop a decision-making framework to support consistent and collaborative weighing practices amongst clinicians within the field of eating disorders that takes individual case circumstances into account. We are making some assumptions for those using this framework that they have basic understanding, a basic understanding of eating disorders. With respect to definitions, open weighing will be defined as weighing the patient with the patient viewing the number on the scale or being advised of the exact weight. Blind weighing is defined as weighing the patient without them seeing the number um, or being told the exact weight. However, non-specific feedback may be given if required as part of the specific clinical intervention being provided. So here is our decision-making framework. Each question has a yes and no response attached. And down the bottom, you'll see the options for open way, blind way, obtain the weight from another clinician, or do not weigh. Let's jump right in with a case example so you can see this framework in action. Lucy is a 23-year-old female with other specified feeding and eating disorder, atypical anorexia nervosa binge purge subtype. 
She's lost 12 and a half kilos in six weeks and is currently a BMI of 24. Lucy's GP has referred her for outpatient treatment with a clinical psychologist and a dietitian who work in different locations. So the first question asked is, are you a member of the core eating disorder treatment team? For the purpose of this framework, that core team consists of a mental health practitioner, dietitian, GP and or psychiatrist who are providing treatment directly targeting the eating disorder presentation. Other medical practitioners, allied health and support workers or recovery coaches are, although valued, not considered part of this core treatment team for the purpose of this framework. Then we have the question, are you the treating mental health clinician? This includes those who are appropriately qualified and are delivering evidence-based psychological therapies for the treatment of eating disorders, such as a psychiatrist, psychologist, or accredited mental health social worker. So let's first follow the path of the clinical psychologist who responds yes to the first question, yes to are you the treating mental health clinician? And next they're asked, does your current formulation and treatment plan include weight concerns as a target? Let's review then why in-session weighing may be undertaken by the psychologist when the formulation and treatment plan involve addressing weight concerns. Depending on the therapeutic modality, weighing may serve a number of functions, including an outcome measure to monitor the progress of therapy for those patients who are below a healthy weight, a proxy measure for the frequency and severity of target behavioural symptoms, such as purging or excessive exercise, a tool for cognitive and behavioural interventions, such as exposure, to provide in vivo stimulus to address emotional responses to weight and weighing in the session, to address life and therapy interfering behaviours, to develop therapist-patient attunement, or to provide an opportunity to coach parents of a young person experiencing an eating disorder in managing eating disorder behaviours or tolerating the young person's distress. So let's say Lucy's clinical psychologist has formulated an over-evaluation of the need to control weight and shape and core low self-esteem as primary targets and she'll be delivering enhanced cognitive behavioural therapy. We'll then move down to the question, do you and your client meet criteria for open weighing? There are a few key considerations with open weighing practices. For the clinician, it's important that they possess a set of calibrated medical scales with a maximum weight capacity that's suited to all body sizes and preferably accurate to only 0.5 kilograms so as to prevent patient overinterpretation of small fluctuations. It's also important that they have capacity to provide regular sessions. The regularity and consistency itself is vital to appropriate delivery of a number of psychologically informed approaches to weighing. They also need ample time for the client to be weighed and to debrief with the ability to contain their distress if required. It is absolutely imperative that an explicitly weight neutral stance is held by the clinician given experiences of weight bias, increased psychological vulnerability to depression, low self-esteem, anxiety, poor body image, suicidality, binge eating and disordered weight control practices. And finally, formal training or supervision on open weighing practices is recommended to ensure that there's a method and rationale by which this process can be conducted in a consistent and therapeutic manner. So moving on to patient criteria, the patient needs to be informed of the clinician's rationale for open weighing, the process by which this will occur, the possibility of adverse outcomes and how these will be managed in order to meet the requirements for informed consent. In not all but some circumstances, it may also be necessary to consider whether the patient's distress and eating disorder behaviours can be contained such that weighing doesn't result in repeated medical and psychiatric compromise that prevents further engagement in treatment. There is some evidence to suggest that neurobiological impairment due to malnutrition may play a role in a patient's poor response to some treatment interventions. However, there's currently no validated way to measure this, nor any studies that explicitly explore this interaction. So we'll say that Lucy's psychologist has reviewed these criteria and decided all have been met. She'll therefore end on open weighing and we'll do so with Lucy in accordance with the clinician open weighing criteria and her therapeutic modality of choice. Now let's switch to the perspective of Lucy's GP, who is reviewing her in a weekly 15 minute review session. Lucy's GP is a member of the core eating disorder treatment team, but not a mental health clinician. So next they are asking, does weight need to be assessed or monitored? 
The medical reasons for which weighing is required in the treatment of eating disorders are primarily due to safety and risk. Total weight lost, degree of weight suppression, and or the recency of weight loss are all implicated in medical compromise, risk of repeating syndrome, and the severity of eating disorder symptoms independent of BMI. This means any of our patients who have lost weight or are making attempts to lose or suppress their weight through restriction or any other inappropriate weight control behaviours will need to be monitored regardless of their body size. So regardless of Lucy's BMI, her weight loss and behaviours put her at significant risk and her weight will need to be monitored by her GP. Lucy's GP then asks, is another member of the treatment team weighing the client regularly and able to share the weight? Given Lucy's clinical psychologist is undertaking regular weekly weighing with Lucy, the GP will either attempt to obtain the weight from the psychologist, or if this is not possible, the GP will consider the open weighing criteria, which in the circumstances will lead them to blind weigh Lucy in her medical reviews. Next, we'll consider Lucy's dietitian perspective. The nutritional considerations for weighing include the monitoring of the risk of refeeding syndrome or complications of malnutrition, which again occur in the setting of rapid or recent weight loss. The monitoring of the outcomes of nutritional rehabilitation, for which the goals are to restore sufficient body fat, fat-free mass and nutritional status in those who are malnourished or weight suppressed. Just a side note here that there are significant limitations to the use of weight or BMI's accurate reflections of the nutritional rehabilitation process in undernourished patients, and additions of other anthropometric measures may offer more accurate pictures of this over time. And finally, weighing can provide a stimulus for psychoeducation, nutrition education, and supportive counselling with respect to beliefs about food and weight and the effectiveness of eating disorder behaviours where appropriate for that dietitian's role in treatment. In this case example, Lucy's dietitian does need to monitor the progress of renourishment because she's supporting Lucy with this. And she's also been asked by the clinical psychologist to provide Lucy with some education regarding set point weight, purging and the ineffectiveness of dieting. So Lucy's dietitian is a member of the core eating disorder treatment team, though she's not a mental health clinician and she does need to monitor weight. So in this instance, similar to Lucy's GP, the dietitian will obtain the weight from the psychologist. Aside from those already explored, there are a few other reasons why weighing may need to take place. Examples might be that the weight is required by an insurance company, although this is rare in Australia, I understand it can occur in other countries. If Lucy was an athlete participating in weight sensitive or weight class sport, or if the sport has aesthetic features to part of the performance, then monitoring of weight or body composition might be required. And finally, there may be other medical circumstances for which weighing is necessary, um, such as diabetes, cachexia, end-stage organ failure, dosing of some medications, or during pregnancy. Here are a few more variations on Lucy's case that you're most welcome to review in your own time and run through the framework. I would love for you to run your own clinical scenarios through this framework as well and email me if you identify any scenarios that seem to be a poor fit. This framework is still in the early phase of development, so I very much welcome your feedback as colleagues in the field to guide further refinement. Some limitations to this framework include the methodology for development. In future phases, we're hoping to conduct a systematic literature review, expert panel review and pilot trial. There was a notable absence of evidence for the role of weighing as a specific factor in the efficacy of evidence-based treatment models. And there was also an absence of lived experience perspectives on weighing practices in the literature. And in future, we hope to capture this through either focus groups or a questionnaire developed by an expert panel. Finally, the framework may not capture all scenarios in clinical practice. Thank you all for listening, and I hope to meet many of you in person when we can again cross oceans and borders.